Welcome to BI 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, taught here at the New Covenant College, the Institute of the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. We come now to our overview of the New Testament. We have finished up our four parts of the Old Testament, and we're now getting into the New. And we will begin tonight with the New Testament historical books. And by this designation, we are referring to the Gospels and the book of Acts. Back when we were covering the Old Testament, I made mention that we uh, differentiate New Testament historical books and Old Testament historical books because each testament has books that we would designate as historical. Uh, these books, the New Testament historical books, which if I say historical books for the rest of this class, know that I'm talking about the New Testament. These books provide a historical account of the events between the first coming of Christ and the development of the apostolic church. So, a much shorter period of time is covered in the New Testament historical books than in the Old Testament historical books. There's also fewer New Testament historical books than Old Testament historical books. Uh, the birth of Jesus, the works of Jesus, His teachings, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension, they are all included in the Gospels. And then in the book of Acts, we see, uh, well, we see the ascension in the book of Acts and the spread of His church as it's there in, happening in the first century. That's all in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So these are very, very important books. Before we can jump right into these books, though, we need to talk about something called the intertestamental period. Intertestamental. And uh, you can see, as I write this word, that it comes from two words, inter, you know, between or in the midst of, intertestamental. So in between the testaments, the intertestamental period. This is the context that we need to establish before we can understand the historical books. After the ministry of Malachi, the prophet, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets, uh, the writing prophets, that is. There were four hundred years of silence, four hundred years of silence that passed by in which God gave no scripture and sent no prophets, four hundred years of silence. One man said that God was so mad at Israel that he didn't speak to them for four hundred years. And then that silence was broken when the voice of one crying in the wilderness, John the Baptist came out and said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this intertestamental period, this period of silence for 400 years, it was a period of waiting and preparation for the coming Messiah. But several major changes took place during this period, and they were not changes for the better necessarily. As you've seen in your study of the Old Testament, Israel's history is one that is marked of continual apostasy, and continual backsliding and uh, save the hand of God coming in to rescue them from the mess that they get themselves into. It seems that we as God's people, without His ever-present guiding and direction, are prone to wander. And several major changes came upon the world and upon uh, the Jews during this intertestamental period. Uh, such things as the Roman Empire conquered the other Mediterranean kingdoms before it and uh, by the time of Christ, the Roman Empire was essentially ruling the known world. Greek became the common language. Uh, people were speaking Greek. Roman paganism was rampant. There was a revived idolatry that took place there in Rome. And the Jews in Israel were under Roman rule. Uh, the Jews in Israel were under Roman rule. Religiously, much corruption occurred between the Testaments. Uh, there was a lot of religious apostasy that took place. Groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other anti-Christian groups originated during this period. The Talmud was written during this period. Rabbinic Judaism, which is nothing like the religion of Moses, which is, uh, which is not in any way, shape, or form, a precursor to Christianity. It's antithetical to Christianity, the religion of Judaism. That's why I do not refer to uh, the, the Christian 
religion or the Christian faith as a Judeo-Christian religion. There, there's nothing in common with Judaism and Christianity. And Judaism, as we see it in the intertestamental period, is not the religion of Moses. Uh, so these are just some of the things that are taking place. Um, there is very little stand for the truth. There is very little remnant of faithful men and women who served Jehovah God left. It's a very dark day. And this sets the stage for the beginning of the New Testament. When the ministry of John the Baptist was to take place, when John was to come as the forerunner for Christ, this is the setting that we find ourselves in. Now, let's talk about the theological and biblical significance of the New Testament historical books. Well, they illuminate the rest of Scripture and the rest especially of the New Testament. Uh, they contain the fulfillment of types, pictures, and prophecies in the Old Testament. Lots of pictures and promises that were in the Old Testament that we find fulfilled in the historical books. But they also provide a foundation upon which the New Testament epistles will build. The gospel books provide for us an eyewitness account of the life and times of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they are so Christocentric, that these passages are often recommended to new believers. When someone comes to you for the first time and they say, I've just been converted, uh, where should I start? What do you tell them? Well, you probably tell them to start reading the Gospel of John. And the reason for that being is that these books... Every page of them, it's dealing with the ministry of Jesus. It's very much keeping the main thing, the main thing, so to speak. Uh, and while these, while these books are of monumental importance, we do need to add a caveat and remember that they're no more inspired uh, than other portions of Scripture. And in a sense, they're no more important. There is a sense in which uh, for some doctrines or some areas, some Scripture is more important than others. Right? If I was going to give a lesson on justification by faith, there would be several passages that would be very important for our study. Romans 3, for instance, right, uh, would perhaps be more important to us than Ecclesiastes. But if I was going to give a, a lesson on practical wisdom, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes would probably be a lot more important than, say, Revelation 17, for instance. That doesn't mean that one of those portions is more important contextually, but just that different portions of the Bible highlight uh, individual and specific things. And so the Gospels highlight the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's obviously nothing in them that would contradict other portions of Scripture. I always think it's funny when someone says, well, I, I really like the way that Jesus is presented in uh, the Gospels, but I don't like the way God presents himself in Leviticus. Well, you have to understand that the Jesus of Nazareth that walked this earth is the same one who said those things in Leviticus. It's, it's, it's our triune God and Jesus, the incarnate word, right? Uh, so that's just something we need to really be clear about as we're studying Scripture. If you divide the New Testament into three sections, and these are the three sections that we're going to be using, just as we had four for the Old Testament, we're going to divide it into three sections. The historical books, New Testament historical books, the Pauline epistles. I'll write this up here. So you have the historical books here, so this would be one. And then you have the Pauline epistles. And then thirdly, you have what we're calling the general epistles. And this could be broken down a little more comprehensively, um, but time not permitting for this class, we're going to have to throw some things into some broader categories. But if you broke the New Testament down this way, uh, the New Testament historical books make up 60% of the New Testament. Only five books, there's 27 books in the New Testament, so these five make up 60% of the New Testament. So therefore, we must give this portion of our Bible its due study. We need to make sure that we're giving it its due study. So let's look at the Gospels. The Gospels, the Gospels re refer, of course, to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The word gospel literally means glad tidings or good news. Glad tidings or good news. And it primarily refers to the truths about, uh, about Christ that must be trusted on 
for salvation. The truths about Christ that must be trusted on for salvation. When you talk about what is the gospel, someone might say, well, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ or the truth that God formulated a plan of redemption to save a chosen people and send his son to die, however they want to word that, right? That is the gospel. And so someone else might say, well, what are the gospel books? Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what's the correlation? Well, the correlation is that those facts that formulate our answer for what is the gospel are best presented in their historical settings in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we call them the gospel books because they contain the gospel story. And the three books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three Gospels, are often called synoptic Gospels. Synoptic Gospels, and uh, I'll write that up here as well. Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic. And this is uh, really just a fancy word uh, to refer to the fact that these three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, present the same view, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a little bit of a different view, I should say, on the same thing. So they're all talking about the, the same thing, but they present a little bit of a different view, and that's why they call, they're called the sin optic. You see the sin, where we have like synonymous, so similar, and then optic, think of your, your lenses, your optics. So similar view is, is what that word means. And uh, these three books, though they have their own unique styles and emphases, uh, you have, um, of course, the authors retaining their own style of writing and their own character. By and large, these books present three different eyewitness accounts of the same events, and they even generally agree in order. So what happens first, what happens second, what happens third, it's, it's pretty much the same in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, some critics have used this to try to attack the integrity of Scripture. And they accuse the authors of copying from one another, and they would even go so far as to say, well, see here, this proves that the Bible is not the Word of God. It's not uh, inspired because all it is is men just copying from one another, copying and recopying. Well, there's some problems with that argument. First of all, it makes perfect sense that these uh, eyewitness accounts would be very similar because, again, they're all written by... Uh, either men who were with Jesus during his ministry or men who were uh, very quick, closely associated with men who were with Jesus during his earthly ministry. So it would be kind of like, um, you could give you two examples, if, say, you and your friend were standing on opposite sides of the street and a car crash happened right in front of you. Now you might say the red car was speeding by and it, it blew through a red light and it ran and it hit the other car uh, in the rear. Well, your friend might say it was 2 o'clock and it was raining and the red car ran through a red light and he hit the purple car. Well, you didn't say anything about the rain. So does that mean that your account is incorrect? Well, no, it doesn't. It just means you didn't include that detail, whereas your friend did. Uh, but perhaps your friend didn't include any detail about the direction he was traveling or so on and so forth. You're not uh, presenting a different account or presenting a contradictory account, just simply an account that includes different details. And that's what Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. Uh, or let's say your grandfather is a World War II veteran and he dictates for you his entire experience in the war. And he tells you a very detailed account of everything that took place while he was overseas in the war. And you, let's say you wrote his memoir down exactly based upon the information that he gave you. And then let's say that he wrote an autobiography. Okay. Well, is there going to be contradictory information? Well, not if, not if you've done your diligent study. You're not going to contradict one another, but you might include some different details. You're definitely going to have a different writing style. So, see, this does not preclude the fact that the Bible is inspired. And furthermore, inspiration does not eliminate human means. Just because someone used a historical document or some outside source does not mean that they were not inspired of God. I believe that Moses probably used historical documents when writing of the history of creation and the early period of the earth and the times of Abraham and the patriarchal period and times that he was not alive to, uh, to experience. 
But just because he might have had some outside helps doesn't mean that it was not inspired. So uh, that's a, a logical fallacy there. The synoptic gospels do not provide any argument for the negation of Scripture's inspiration or infallibility. So that's the synoptic gospels. The gospel of John is not a synoptic gospel uh, because it's written in a, in a manner that's different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not focus so much on chronology. It's, John is not about what happens first or what happens second. John is written more in a thematic way, and it focuses on especially highlighting the teachings of Jesus and the works of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. John contains more miracles than all of the other gospel. And we'll see why that is in a moment when we look at the purposes of the gospels. All four gospels have a specific intended audience and a specific intended purpose. And so John is not considered a synoptic gospel, although there are some events reported in John that are also in the other three. There's also a lot of events that are in the three that are not in John or that are in John that are not in the other three. Uh, but we find that, uh, that these four gospels, when put together, when synthesized, when studied, they provide a very sturdy argument for the veracity and the integrity of Scripture. And it is greatly strengthened. The testimony of the Word of God is greatly strengthened by these four eyewitness accounts. You might ask, why did God inspire four men, especially the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to write basically the exact same thing? Why not just have one gospel, right, and one book of Acts? Well, you might be able to explain away or to dispute one isolated record. Right? If you had one account of the life of Jesus written by some obscure author, it might be easy to discount that. But it's quite difficult to deny four corroborating witnesses who wrote in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. The, these men were writing at a time in which other men were living who also witnessed the same things. And there is no resource from antiquity disputing any of their claims. The congruity and the antiquity of the Gospels is a great proof of their truthfulness. So uh, that's the theological biblical significance of the Gospels. The book of Acts, though not a Gospel per se, is written by Luke, who was a Gospel author. And many of the same arguments of the integrity of the Gospels would also apply to the book of Acts, such as the corroboration with other eyewitnesses, the historicity of uh, Luke's reportings, the fact that Luke was a personal companion on some of the things that he was reporting of, and he interviewed other companions on other things. Uh, so we find that these books, though the Bible is not a history textbook, these books are entirely historically accurate. So uh, that's a little overview of the theological and biblical significance. Let's look at the contents of these books, the contents. Let's begin with Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is primarily addressed to the Jews, and it seeks to present Jesus as the perfect Messiah. So it's addressed to the Jews, seeks to present Jesus as the perfect Messiah. Therefore, Matthew begins with a genealogy tracing Jesus back to Abraham. And you'll see in the book of Matthew uh, that uh, a lot of Old Testament references and promises are finding their culmination in Christ. And Matthew is highlighting the great covenantal transition from Old Covenant administration to New Covenant administration. In the book of Matthew, we see God laying aside Old Testament Israel as the visible manifestation of God's kingdom and establishing His New Testament church. In the, the Gospel of Matthew, you hear uh, references to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven more so than in other um, Gospels because Matthew is steeped in this Jewish literature, in this Jewish phraseology. Gospel of Mark. Mark is primarily addressed to the Romans. Mark is addressed to the Romans, a so Gentile nation, and it seeks to present Jesus as the perfect servant. It seeks to present Jesus as the perfect servant. Notice how these Gospels are all uh, appealing to what the audience most desires. Right? Who do the Jews desire most? They desire the Messiah. That's who they're looking for, right? Well, what about the Romans? 
Well, the Romans are all about servanthood and valor and this kind of warrior mentality, living your life for this grand purpose. Well, Jesus was the ultimate servant. He was the ultimate purposeful man. And uh, therefore, Mark contains no genealogy. So it doesn't matter who you are. It's all about your service, all about your character, right? Um, Mark is generally considered to be the first gospel written. And it's also the shortest of the gospel gospels because it doesn't include many details. Mark is all about action because a servant should be all about action, right? And um, words like immediately and straight away and anon, they are all very prevalent in Mark's gospel. It's a lively book and it highlights the things that Jesus did in his ministry to those around him, uh, the Son of Man who came to minister. The Gospel of Luke is primarily addressed to the Greek primarily addressed to the Greek. You could even argue that it was addressed to a single man named Theophilus, who was a Greek, um, which we find there in the book of Acts, that he had written a former treatise to Theophilus, which refers to his gospel. And the book of Luke seeks to present Jesus as the perfect man. The Greeks were all into anthropology and, and uh, getting the perfect man, right? And therefore, in uh, the, the book of Luke, there is a genealogy that traces Jesus back to Adam. Traces Jesus back to Adam. goes all the way back because it's trying to prove Jesus as the ultimate man. It's saying that from Adam to this man named Jesus, there's never been a better man than this guy. And um, we find here that Luke stresses the true humanity of Christ. Now, Jesus was truly God and truly man, divine yet human and those two natures never mixed, never mingled, but existed within uh, one body. And Luke uh, denotes physical details and, and medical details that the other Gospels don't mention, um, such as the sweating of the drops of blood. And one of the reasons why this is so in Luke's Gospels, as you'll remember, Luke is a physician. Luke is a physician. And so, uh, Luke includes some of these details to highlight the humanity of the Lord Jesus. And his style as a historian is also seen in the manner in which he presents the facts of Christ's ministry. So Luke writes very technically. Uh, he's a very tactical uh, author and uh, provides a really unique resource in the pool of gospel accounts. And lastly, the book of John. Now John, being different as it is, is addressed to the whole world. It has a very broad audience, and it seeks to present Jesus as perfect God. So you have him as the Messiah, as the perfect servant, as the perfect man, and now we see him as perfect God. John doesn't contain a typical genealogy, but rather it begins with eternity. It, it begins the same way Genesis begins. In the beginning was the Word. Right? And John clearly states his purpose in John 20 and verse 31. And that purpose is that his audience might believe on Jesus and have life through his name. So uh, John is, is different than the other gospel accounts in that it's seeking to prove him as God. So it's not following necessarily a chronology. It's not documenting him as just a mere man. But it's highlighting specific events that prove and indicate that this man is God. And as already stated... Uh, John is highlighting the, the miracles and the works as part of Christ's ministry, emphasizing his deity. Luke and John are, are, are very wonderful uh, gospels to read as companions one to another because they both highlight the, the two natures of the Lord Jesus in his personal ministry. The book of Acts is best understood as a continuation of Luke's gospel. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, as we just mentioned, uh, Luke says, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. Now, Theophilus was apparently a prominent Greek. Most uh, would say that he was some kind of military or governmental leader. And he was someone who was interested in this story of Jesus of Nazareth. And so he asked Luke the physician if Luke would write him an account. And Luke says, the former treatise have I made of all that Jesus began 
both to do and to teach. So that uh, speaks to his gospel. So if the gospel of Luke was what Jesus began to do and teach in his earthly ministry, then the book of Acts documents what Jesus continues to do and teach through his church. Uh, Acts, though a letter, is presented as a historical narrative. So it's, it's, though it's a letter, it's presented as a historical narrative, and it is monumental in understanding the rest of the New Testament. You cannot understand the remainder of the New Testament without the book of Acts. Acts is a transitional book, and it provides for us a bridge that takes us from the Gospels to the Epistles. For instance, if you read the Gospels and then went straight to the Epistles, you would have some questions. You would wonder, who is this Paul guy? Who is this Apollos guy? Who is Timothy? Where are all these churches coming from? How did the gospel get into Asia and Europe? Well, these are all questions that you learn in the book of Acts. In Acts, we see the historical context for the rest of the New Testament. So as we're reading these epistles, none of them shock us or surprise us. We understand how these churches got there because we can see that happening in the book of Acts. Now, for the first 12 chapters, Acts centers around the early church and the ministry of Peter, who was the apostle to the Jews. But there, about midways, chapter 13, we see the transition taking place from an emphasis upon the Jewish ministry of Peter to a shift and a spread of the apostle Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. And uh, one must know something of the life of Paul in order to understand Acts and the Pauline epistles. And when we discuss Paul's epistles, we will talk a little bit about his life. But you need to understand uh, that Paul is a major character in the book of Acts. If you read the, the book of Acts and study the ministry and the life of Paul, it will aid your understanding greatly in uh, the epistles, understanding something of his character and his person. Another interesting thing to know about the book of Acts is that it highlights the preaching of the early church. 25% of the book of Acts consists of sermons. It's one in every four verses. And we hear sermons there. We read them from people such as Peter and Stephen and James and, of course, the Apostle Paul. We see in Acts that the early church did not rely on gimmicks or cheap tricks to advance the gospel, but they trusted in prayer and the proclamation of God's word to advance the divine purposes. So we see how we have a model here for how we are to conduct the ministry. How are we to plant churches? How are we to evangelize? How are we to spread the gospel throughout the world? Well, we see how they did it in Acts. We need to do it like that. <laughs> And more than just providing us with historical facts, the New Testament historical books reveal an intimate look at the Lord Jesus and His disciples. We see in these books the establishing of Christ's kingdom on earth and the beginning of its never-ending expanse. And this portion of Scripture marks the beginning of the new covenant blessedness of which we are all partakers. So there's a, a lot of changes going on in these books as we get in the Gospels and the book of Acts. And it's really important to understand what's taking place here if we're following that covenantal redemptive hermeneutic. As we see what's taking place here in God's plan of redemption so that we can understand the emphases of the remainder of the New Testament. So uh, let's get into the Pauline epistles when we meet together next time. God bless you and thank you.